Okay, turn in your Bible to John chapter 7. Last week, remember, we uh, started, well, two weeks ago actually now, we started a series about God's program. And mainly that has to do with what we have referred to as God's exercise program, which of course is found in 2 Peter chapter 1. And we're going to get to some more of that tonight. But first, okay, tonight the title for this part of the series is Gaining Knowledge. And here in John chapter 7, Jesus gives us the rule, I guess I would say, the, the indication of receiving knowledge from God or understanding what God is telling us and what it takes for us to get knowledge and understanding from God. And here, here's what he says. Well, first of all, he was challenged about whether he was, uh, you know, a false prophet. The, the religious leaders at the time were challenging his authority to say the things he was saying. And here's what he says in John chapter 7, verse 17. He says, If any man desires to do God's will, whoa, then he will know, he will have the needed illumination to recognize and can tell for himself whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking from myself and of my own accord and on my own authority. He who speaks on his own authority seeks to win honor for himself. But he who seeks the glory and honor and is eager for the honor of him who sent him, he is true and there is no unrighteousness, falsehood, or deception in him. Well, he's telling us two things here. First of all, he's telling us that he is speaking on behalf of the Father. That he, he says all through the gospel, he said, hey, I'm just telling you what God told me to say. And these works that I do, healing people, casting out demons, uh, multiplying loaves and fishes, these are the works, these are works of God. This, this um, uh, proved his divine nature. This proved that he was not just a, a great prophet, but that he was the son of God. But here he's telling us something important. He says that if we want to know what God says, if we want to understand the Word of God, if we want to understand the truth, it requires something on our part. It requires a commitment. It says we need to desire to do God's will. That's really kind of the gist of what we're talking about tonight when we're going to talk about exercising virtue to gain knowledge. Well, the virtue that we're talking about is the desire to know God, to seek God. You know, like it says, seek first the kingdom of God. Well, that is a virtue. Everybody in the world doesn't seek God. And seeking God is a, a virtue. That, that, that's, that's the key to living a righteous life is to seek God, okay? And it says it this way in Proverbs. Go to Proverbs chapter 2. There are those in the world, and they're not all Christians, who seek truth. And sometimes they seek it in the wrong places. I remember there was a country song, looking for love in all the wrong places. Well, people do that. You know, that people are hungry for something, and so they'll look, and, and they start looking at what's all around them, and, you know, if it's, if it's not God, you're not going to find it. But you keep looking. you got to keep looking until you find it. And... You know, Jesus said, seek and you shall find. <clears throat> and here in Proverbs chapter 2, it says it this way. It says, my son, if you will receive my words and treasure up 
my commands, the Word of God, in other words, within you, making your ear attentive to skillful and godly wisdom and inclining and directing your heart and mind to understanding. If you cry out for insight, raise your voice for understanding. If you seek wisdom as for silver and search for skillful and godly wisdom as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the reverent and worshipful fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Well, he's saying that you've got to prioritize seeking. You've got to make seeking God job number one if you want to know the truth and you want to, uh, to know what God knows. And that's what we're talking about over here in 2 Peter chapter 1. Let's, let's get back into the exercise program here. When we're talking about knowledge, we're talking about the things that God knows. We're talking about wisdom, actually, skillful and godly wisdom. Really, wisdom and knowledge are kind of cre uh, the same. Uh, wisdom is, is the ability to correctly use knowledge. Now, here in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, you know, we started a couple of weeks ago. It says, For this very reason, add your diligence to the divine promises and employ every effort in exercising your faith to develop virtue. And exercising virtue to develop knowledge. <clears throat> okay, let's back up and review a little bit about faith. Um, we know what faith is. Faith. Well, keep the place here in First Peter chapter one. Go to Hebrews chapter eleven. The Bible defines faith. Hebrews 11 verse 1. Faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of things we hope for, being the proof of things we do not see and the conviction of their reality. Faith perceives as real fact that which is not revealed to the senses. And in verse 3 it says that uh, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed and fashioned and put in order by the word of God. So that what we see is made out of things which are not visible. The word of God in other words. So when we're talking about seeking the knowledge of God, we're talking about something which the Word of God conveys to us. But it's, we're going to have to receive it by faith and not by having to see it manifested in the physical in front of you. If, if you have to see that, then it's not faith anymore. In other words... God will reveal things to His people. If you're, if you're a spiritual person, if you're born again, God will reveal it to you in a way that the world's not going to be able to get it. I mean, there are some things God will, you know, when, uh, the, you know, when the second coming of Jesus comes, it says, every eye will see Him. You know, it's going to be visible in the physical, but that doesn't mean everybody's going to be saved because some are going to be beating their breasts saying, oh, no, it was real. Right? So, but if you're God's child, you don't have to wait until it's physically manifest for you to know that it's real. It says faith accepts as real fact that which is not revealed to the senses. And that's faith, okay? And Romans 8, check, keep the place here in Hebrews as well as the place in 2 Peter. Uh, 2 Peter. And go to Romans chapter 8. The 8th chapter of Romans kind of makes the same point about how what the senses, what's revealed to the senses is different than what 
skillful and godly wisdom is. In other words, um, faith is not the same thing as ordinary perception. Faith is not the same thing as common sense. Faith is not necessarily scientific. It's not necessarily reasonable. It's not necessarily empirical or provable. Okay? Because all of those things don't require you to be in a relationship with God in order to get it. All right? Uh, Romans 8 verse 5 says, Those who are according to the flesh and controlled by its unholy desires set their minds on and pursue those things which gratify the flesh. Now that tells us something right there. Everybody is going to seek and pursue something. It's just in our nature to, to grasp at something which is beyond ourselves. All right? But if, if you are not, if you have not made a commitment to God, to the Lord Jesus Christ, then what you're going to be seeking is to gratify your flesh. Okay? In fact, I, even as Christians, there is always that tendency to fall back on self-gratification. It says, but those who are according to the Spirit are controlled and are controlled by the desires of the Holy Spirit, set their minds on and seek the things which gratify the Holy Spirit. Now, the mind of the flesh is death. That is to say, it compromises miseries, because miseries come from sin. But the mind of the Spirit is life and peace. And that's because the mind of the flesh, with its carnal thoughts and purposes, is hostile to God. It does not submit itself to God. Indeed, it cannot. You say, well, why can't it? Because it can only accept what is physically perceived. The flesh is not going to uh, defer to something it does not see, feel, experience in some physical way. That is by nature a spiritual function. Okay. Now, back to Second Peter chapter 1. It says that we exercise our faith to develop virtue by, by believing in something which goes beyond what our senses can tell us. That by itself will make us a better person, which is basically what we mean when we say virtue. It's, uh, you know, the, the Amplified, I think, defines it here as... Um, Oh, how does that? Excellence, resolution, Christian energy. The word is aretes, number 703 in Strong's Concordance. We could say it's, it's power and it's might and it's, it's uh, integrity, it's uprightness, it's holy living. And it requires faith to, to do that. Okay, but it, let's don't stop there. Then it says... When you, uh, when you are living by faith and you are living a, an upright, righteous life, what you need it in, in continuing to grow spiritually, you need to be seeking knowledge. Now, this is a, this is a process. It's a lifelong process. Learning of any kind really is a long, lifelong learning process. I, anytime you quit learning, you die. Even in, even in physical knowledge, physical experience, we're always gaining new uh, experiences in life. I mean, we were talking about, uh, you were talking earlier about how now to, uh, to deal with contractors of various sorts you have to take pictures of things with your cell phone. Well, that, you know, that's, that's like a new kid on the block for me. Now, for, for my kids and for 
people younger than them. It's like they don't know, they don't know what life was like before they did that. Kind of like some people don't know what life was like before microwave ovens, right? Um, you know, or before uh, telephones or before automobiles. I mean, you know, there, you can go back and, and you know, our, our dependence on technology has become rather extreme here in these times. But, but see, it, it's an ongoing thing. And, and even people that are senior citizens like me, still we still have to function in that world so we still have to learn how to use our cell phone to show somebody you know what the the vin number of our car is or some such you know it, it's like well you know you have to learn it sooner or later it, I, you know i went and bought something at the hardware store the other day and back in the day it would have been all assembled and it was sitting out front and you just Go tell the guy you want it, and then they'll go load it in your car, and you take it home, and you start using it. Well, now they give it to you in a box, and you have to assemble it yourself. And you look at the manual, and it was like, you know, the thing was made in China or somewhere, so whoever translated the, the instructions into English, it's like it doesn't make a bit of sense. So I had to go to the Internet and say, how do you assemble this thing? And there's some guy on there, okay, well, you, you take this bolt out of here, and you stick that bolt in there, and it's like... Okay, and it made perfect sense, and I did it, and it worked. Hallelujah. <laughs> okay. But see, I, you didn't used to have to do that. So li li learning is a lifelong activity, even in the natural, even in the flesh. But it is in the spirit also. This is my point. Go back to Romans uh, chapter 12. Here's something else. Here's another way of saying, of making this point that to get the knowledge that God wants us to have as spiritual beings, it requires a commitment on our part. Romans 12, verse 1. I appeal to you, brethren, and beg of you, in view of the mercies of God, to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all your members and faculties as a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated, and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable service and spiritual worship. Okay, so that's where virtue starts, is, is by us Committing our lives to God. That's faith. You know, it takes faith to do that. In fact, if you do that, if, if, if you just pray the sinner's prayer and mean it, that is a step of faith, and that's where it all begins. Okay? You say, I believe, believe Jesus that you died for me, and I accept you as my Savior, and by your help and grace I'll live for you. Okay, then you are you exercising your faith to gain virtue right there. Okay, but it doesn't stop there. Unfortunately for some Christians, it does, but it shouldn't. Because then in verse 2 it says, And do not be conformed to this world, fashioned after and adapted to its external, superficial customs, but be transformed and changed by the entire renewal of your mind, by new ideals and a new attitude, so that you may prove for yourselves. Now there's something here, I want to make a point later on here, that we have to do this individually. Each one of us has to do this for ourselves. Nobody's going to do it for us. And it doesn't just happen uh, ex post facto. It, it does require that commitment from, from us. But if we do that, then we can get knowledge for ourselves that we can use. Each one of us individually can use the revelation God gives us to prove for ourselves what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God, even that thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in His will for you. See, so this verse 2 is telling us a couple of things. It, first of all, it's telling us that what God, the wisdom that He had has for us if we will follow that, 
if we will obey that, if we will align ourselves with it, it's going to make us different than the rest of the world. Keep the place here and let's go to Titus chapter 2. Pardon me? Titus. Titus, the book of Titus, chapter 2. One of those little books right there back toward the back. This goes along with what it said there about not being conformed to this world. Well, see, if you're not living by faith, you're going to, you're going to conform to the spirits of the age. The stuff that's in the world is going to affect you somehow. And the only way for that not to happen is, is this here. Uh, Titus chapter 2 verse 11. For the grace of God has come forward for the deliverance from sin and for, for eternal salvation for mankind. And it trains us to reject and renounce all ungodliness and worldly passionate desires to live discreet, temperate, self-controlled, upright, devout, spiritually whole lives in this present world. See, that's how we do that not being conformed to this world. It is, is that we receive God's grace. And God's grace isn't a get-out-of-trouble-free card. It's, it's a training. See, some people have the wrong idea about grace. That grace is indulgence. No, grace is training. Grace is a motivation. It's an empowerment to do what maybe you would not be inclined to do otherwise. Let's say, you know, to be patient or to forgive or, or to, um, to give, to, to, um, to be something that your personality maybe is not inclined toward, but you know you need to do it. Well, you've got to have God's grace. Reminds me of that song La Bamba in Spanish. It said, to dance La Bamba, you need a little grace. Well, if I was going to dance anything, the La Bamba or a waltz or a polka or anything, I'd need some grace, let me tell you. But see, that's, that's like to live the Christian life, you need some grace. And that's why he gives it, is for you to be this, this new creature in Christ. You're going to have to have grace to be a new creature in Christ. All right? But... Verse 13, it says, As we await and look for the fulfillment and realization of our blessed hope, which is the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, the Messiah. It's not just dying and going to heaven, in other words. Okay, go back to Romans chapter 12. You know, not conform to this world, but be transformed so that we can know, that word know is connected with the word knowledge, right? Okay, so that we can have knowledge of what God's will is, and good and acceptable and perfect though it be, we have to know that. We have to know. See, I don't think there's three wills that God has. I don't think that's what's being implied here. I think it's saying that there's three aspects of God's will that we can experience. And it might be a progression. It's like at first God's will might just be acceptable. And, and then it might be, I mean, at first it might be good. Oh, yeah, that's good, but I can't do that. <laughs> and then, then, okay, it's good, and all right, I accept that. Yes, I know I need to do that. And then it's perfect. It's like you do it, you experience it, and then, wow, that's great. That's perfect. And it was God's will all the time, but you're, you entered into it by your, your commitment to it, you see. It started off, well, just good, and then it's acceptable, and then it's perfect. But it's God's will all the time, right? Okay. Go to, keep, uh, I'll tell you what. No, I think you'll let this place go. Go back to Second Peter. And we're going to go back a few verses from where we were a moment ago. Go to verse 3. 
2 Peter 1, verse 3. This is what we want as far as experiencing God's will. This is why we want, this is why we should want to experience God's will. Now, most of us, if, uh, if, if the devil's trying to do something and we know that's not God's will, then we should want God's will to counter that, all right? But this is not talking about that. It says, for God's divine power has bestowed on us all things <clears throat> that are suited to life and godliness through the full personal knowledge of Him who has called us to His own glory and excellence. And it's by means of <clears throat> these that He has bestowed on us precious and exceedingly great promises so that through them we may escape from the moral decay, rottenness, and corruption that's in the world because of covetousness, lust, and greed and become sharers and partakers of the divine nature. Now he mentions here that through his word... <clears throat> we then can get delivered from that human tendency toward selfishness, greed, lust, covetousness, and that through His Word, we can become like God wants us to be. Well, let's talk about that. Keep the place here in First Peter 1. Go back to Hebrews chapter 4 this time. I know I'm bouncing around a lot, but I'm trying to connect some, some dots here. I'm trying to connect some concepts that you can see it says it over here, and then it says it over here, and it's all the same topic, right? Okay, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says that the Word, these are God's precious promises, right? They're in His Word, okay? The Word that God speaks, it's alive and full of power. It's not a dead letter, in other words making it active, operative, energizing, and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword penetrating to the dividing line of the soul and the spirit. See, our soul is where our mind is, and that's where a lot of the battle is. That's where the devil throws thoughts at us that are contrary to God's will and that make us wanting to be some way God doesn't want us to be and then it's like, okay, I know what God says. I know that's right and that's good, but I just can't find it within myself to do it. Well, that's where the Word put in that place enables you to put that aside and go over where God wants you to go because that's what the Word does. It, it, it gets in there, all right? And it says it, uh, it's the deepest parts of our nature. It, it, it's the joints and marrow, the deepest parts of our nature. The Word exposes, sifts, and analyzes, and judges the very thoughts and purposes of the heart. And not a creature exists that is concealed from his sight, but all things are open and exposed, naked and defenseless to the eyes of whom we have to do. Now, there's a contrast here between being exposed to human scrutiny and being exposed to God's scrutiny. Because humans don't see everything. I mean, it's kind of like the difference between, you know, let's say, a doctor examining you, you know, taking your pulse or looking at the color of your skin or something, say, okay, you look healthy, versus doing an MRI scan, <laughs> where they're, they're looking at all the cells inside your body. Well, see, God's knowledge of us is like the MRI scan. He sees stuff inside that we, we may not even be. In fact, I'd say typically we aren't aware of what goes on inside of us because a lot of it is, is conditioned responses to things that happened way back that we don't even know that that got encoded into us. 
But God sees that. And people can't see that. That's why God's really the only one qualified to judge and why he tells us not to judge because we can't see all of that stuff. <clears throat> okay, now, I think I've made the point about how making a commitment to God will open us up to what he knows and how what he knows, it covers everything. It says everything that's suited for life and godliness. Anything we need to know, God's word has got the answer. That, that's why we study the word so intently here at Romans 8. We're, we're not doing it just to try to show how spiritually uh, astute we are. We're not trying to compete with other Christians of other denominations or this or that. Or We're not trying to, to uh, earn brownie points or stars in our crown or something religious. We're, we're doing this because it matters. Because if, if the, the word properly applied in our lives will change us, will make, we'll make better, make things better. It will always be better to go by God's word than to go by our own uh, understanding. Just say it that way. Now, here, here is a problem or several different versions of a problem. And that is that the devil counterfeits the things of God. Uh, as Owen Cain used to say, the devil is a plagiarist. A plagiarist is, is like someone who steals the intellectual property of, you know, you write a song and somebody steals that song and puts their name on it. That's plagiarism. And a lot of that goes on in the realm of music and literature and other areas like that. But see, that's, that's the devil. That's how he does what he does. He doesn't come up. He doesn't create anything. He simply steals the things of God and twists them, puts his stamp on it, and then says, this is how it is. And then he, he tries to sell that to you as if that's God when it isn't. It's really... It's really God that he, the things of God that he has twisted and perverted. Now, there are counterfeits to skillful godly wisdom. Not everything that appears to be uh, wise is. Let's talk about some of these things. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And here, I'm talking to Christians. I'm talking to committed Christians. I'm talking, I dare say, to everyone listening to this has been a Christian for, for a while. And, and you maybe have... Uh, you know, you have learned some things over the years, maybe more so than some of your uh, friends and, and peers uh, that have been, you know, with you along your, your spiritual journey. But what we have, these are things we have to learn one way or the other. And as I said, this is a lifelong process because it seems like the, the, as, as society evolves and devolves and deteriorates more and more, then the devil gets more and more complicated and more and more clever with his counterfeits. But let me just give you a, a few. First of all, the first counterfeit we need to watch out for that, that passes as spiritual knowledge is pride. Or maybe I should say arrogance. Or there's another word, hubris, which is, you know, I've got it. I've got the answer. You know, I, I am right. Now, I'm not saying if you are right that you should always be questioning whether you're right. I mean, if you're right, go with what you believe. And if it isn't right, you know, God will show you. <laughs> All right? I know that sounds like, well, I, I, you know, I want to be more sure than that. Well, sometimes that's the best you can do. All right? Here, let me read it. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1. Now about food offered to idols, 
Of course, we know that all of us possess knowledge about these matters. Yet, mere knowledge causes people to be puffed up, to bear themselves loftily, and to be proud. But love edifies and builds up and encourages one to grow to his full stature. So he's making a, a, a contrast between pride and love having to do with knowledge. In other words, you can have knowledge, but if you use it in a prideful way, it's harmful. But if you use it in a loving way, it's helpful. In verse 2 he says, And if anyone imagines that he has come to know or understand much of divine things, he does not yet perceive and recognize and understand as strongly and clearly, nor has he become as intimately acquainted with anything as he ought or as is necessary. You know, if you say, well, by golly, I know what I know. Well, maybe you do know what you know, but there's some things you don't know. And if you don't know what you don't know, then you've got some learning to do. So it's good to, whatever it is you know, it's good to not think, oh, I've got this because I know this. Fine, you know it, but you shouldn't get proud because of what you know, in other words. Verse 3, but if anyone loves God truly, then he is known by God. See, that's that intimate knowledge that he's talking about. Okay, another telling sign that what is passing as wisdom isn't all that it should be. I'll say it that way. In fact, it's not just that it isn't all that it should be or could be. It, it's, it's the wrong kind of wisdom. And let me tell you, in America today, in 2024, we are in a political season and this, this form of knowledge is, is weaponized. And, and what I'm talking about is strife, it's contention, it's arguing, fighting, disagreeableness. Now again, I'm not saying that you should agree with every wrong thing that's out there just to get along, okay? Uh, th- th- but there is a way to be right without being obnoxious. Okay, let's read it. James chapter 3, verse 13. Who is there among you who is wise and intelligent? Then let him by his noble living. So he didn't say anything about his debating ability or he could shout his opponents down or... You know, he, he's, a, he's a better fighter than the rest of them. He said, no, you show your, your wise and intelligent by noble living. That's virtue, see. Let him by his noble living show forth good works with the unobtrusive humility, which is the proper attribute of true wisdom. See, there's a connection between virtue and knowledge right there. He said, but then he contrasts that in verse 14, says, But if you have bitter jealousy and envy and contention, rivalry and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not pride yourself on it and thus be in defiance of and false to the truth. That kind of wisdom is not what comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, animal, even devilish. For wherever there is jealousy, envy, and contention, rivalry, and selfish ambition, there will be confusion, unrest, disharmony, rebellion, and all sorts of evil and vile practices. Now, let me just digress briefly regarding the situation in America this political year that we find ourselves and I do believe that the devil is, is manipulating this. I'm, I'm thoroughly convinced that he is. That, I mean, okay, every time, I mean, there does need to be, there, if, if there were no difference between political parties, then, you know, why have elections? It's like it doesn't matter. Okay, but the divisions that exist 
in America today over so many things are so, the partisan division is so deep and so wide that I can see how demonic spiritual forces are trying to push this toward chaos, toward civil war, toward rebellion, revolution, toward the destruction of America. It's not toward making America better. It's toward my, making my side right, and I don't care what happens to the rest of you. See, that, that's, that's what he's talking about, rebellion and every evil work. But the wisdom that comes down from above is pure, undefiled, it's peace-loving, courteous, considerate, gentle. It's willing to yield to reason, full of compassion and good fruits, wholehearted, straightforward, impartial, and unfeigned. It's not hypocritical, in other words. That gives us a pretty good litmus test to determine within the realm of politics or within the realm of just social discourse, whether when somebody appears to be right, is it righteousness of God's kind or is it fleshly pride kind of righteousness? Okay, here's another one. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Now, there is a whole volume worth of stuff that could be said about this one. And there's only one little comment about this here at the end of 1 Timothy chapter 6. Just, just two little verses warning Timothy about this. But this was a big problem in the first century and much of what the epistles in, in the New Testament deal with were because of these false teachers that were going around presenting a perverted version of Christianity. And in other places, you can see the word knowledge used. In fact, it's used here. 1 Timothy 6, verse 20. Timothy, guard and keep the deposit trusted to you. The, the, the revelation knowledge of the Word of God. Keep it. Turn away from irreverent babble and godless chatter with vain, empty, worldly phrases and the subtleties and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge and spiritual illumination. Well, the word knowledge in Greek is gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S. -S. And this religion or this movement that was going on in the first century that was perverting the gospel as it was being preached by the apostles is often called gnosticism, <coughs> from the word gnosis, which means knowledge. They were claiming, these other false teachers were claiming to have knowledge that they received from God, but it was not from God. It was from the devil. And in verse 21 it says, And by making such professions, some have erred and missed the mark regarding the faith. Simply put, it was contradicting the faith. It was contradicting the word. It's, you know, it goes back to what the devil did with Eve. Say, so, well, did God really say this? No, it really means this over here. And, you know, if, if uh, and this, look, this goes on in the church today. You know, some, some that we might call more liberal-leaning Christians, they don't really believe you should take the word of God as a guide for you. It's like, well, that was, you know, they were ignorant back then in the first century, and we know better now. That's Gnosticism. And, and see, that's, that's the wrong. In fact, interestingly enough, in the King James Version of the Bible, in verse 20, he's warning Timothy against, it says, against science falsely so called uses the word science. 
Well, see, science, scientia in Latin just means knowledge. Scientia or science is the Latin word that gnosis is the Greek word for. So there is a religion, if you want to call it that, in our world today of scientism, where that which scientists claim to know is considered more reliable than the Bible or than anything else. Well, there's a problem with that, and that is they are placing some human authority above God. Now, that's a big problem. And as I said, there's a whole lot that we could say about that. But let's move on. Go to Colossians chapter 2. See, this is the kind of knowledge we don't want. And here in Colossians chapter 2, there are several different false teachings that Paul is warning them about. But there's one I want to focus on right here. Colossians 2 verse 18. And it kind of connects with what I was saying there about how some people in the world will try to claim that their expertise uh, trumps what God has to say. Colossians 2 verse 18. Let no one defraud you by acting as an umpire. Well, what does an umpire do in a sports contest? It's like he's the authority. He's the one that says whether it was a foul ball or whether it was a strike. Okay? And you can argue with him if you want to, but he's, he's the authority, right? It says, don't let any human being be that for you, declaring you unworthy and disqualifying you for the prize insisting on self-abasement, insisting on you kowtowing to them, in other words, or to worship of, of supernatural beings, taking a stand on visions he claims he's seen, vainly puffed up by sensuous notions. says these are not from the Holy Spirit. These are fleshly things inflated by his unspiritual thoughts and fleshly conceit, not holding fast to the head, that's Jesus. And remember, Jesus is the Word made flesh. Not holding fast to Jesus, from whom the entire body, supplied and knit together by means of its joints and ligaments, grows, or supposed to grow, with the growth that's from God. And if then you have died with Christ to material ways of looking at things. Now, that's a, that's a big... Uh, Big quandary there. Has the church really died to material ways of looking at things? I don't think so. But if you have died to material way of looking at things and have escaped from the world's crude and elemental notions and teachings of externalism, then don't do this, what he's fixing to say. Then, then don't, don't live as if you still belong to the world, submitting to rules and regulations. Like, don't handle this, don't taste that, don't touch that, referring to things which perish with being used. And to do this is to follow human precepts and doctrines. Such practices indeed have the outward appearance that popularly passes for wisdom in promoting self-imposed rigor of discipline and delight in self-humility and severity of discipline of the body. See, you will see as we go through God's exercise program that on down the line, you know, you exercise your faith to develop virtue and exercise your virtue to develop knowledge and you exercise knowledge to develop self-control. So if this appears to be you're, you're, you're holding yourself under control, well, then that's knowledge, isn't it? Not necessarily. You've got to see the motive behind it because it delights in... Humiliation. This is a tell, folks. If somebody or if some authority seems to get jollies off of somebody else's misfortune or unhappiness, that is not God. God is never happy when, when somebody is suffering. God is never happy when somebody is wrong, he says, I don't, I don't take pleasure in the death of the wicked. 
So if you're taking pleasure in the death of the wicked, that's not a godly motive. It, in fact, there's actually a word for that in psychology. It's called being sadistic. It was named after some guy named Said in, in France back hundreds of years ago. Anyway, uh, severity of discipline, but those things are of no value in checking the indulgence of the flesh, the lower nature. Instead, they do not honor God, but they serve only to indulge the flesh. There's a term for this. It's called asceticism that severity of discipline. You know, Buddhist monks in, in Tibet, they, they do that. You know, they go on long, long fasts and they, they isolate themselves from everything and they just, you know, meditate for weeks at a time or whatever and they think that they're holy men because they do that. But this says, uh-uh, that's really a fleshly, it's, it's, it's amplifying and building something in their flesh that God doesn't want. Yeah. Okay, go to Psalm 73. Now, this one, I would say, is probably a lot closer to home than most of those others. I mean, we could, we could some of those others, pride and contention, agnosticism and asceticism, you might say, well, I don't know that, I've, I, don't know that, I'm, that I have a problem with any of those. Well, of course, you might have a bigger problem with it than you realize, but... Let's say, okay, maybe you don't have a problem with those. But this is one I think is, is rather common. Psalm 73. Truly, God is good to those who are upright and pure in heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My, slip had, my, feet had, my steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious of the foolish and arrogant and I saw, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. You know, it's easier for us to see Hollywood stars and, and people in this world who are not living right and they're living the high life and we say, God, that isn't right. For they suffer no violent pains in their death and their strength is firm. And they are not in trouble as other men, neither are they smitten and plagued like other men. And we think they should be because they're not living right. Go to verse 12. Behold, these are the ungodly who always prosper and are at ease in the world, and they increase in riches. You say, well, why could that be? I'll tell you why it could be. Because as 1 John 5, 19 says, the devil is ruling the world right now. The whole world is under the control of the, of the wicked one. So if people are doing the wicked one's bidding, he's going to do whatever it takes to keep them doing it, right? He's got to keep feeding that. And, but then, see, here's where the devil wants us to take that. It says, but then surely in vain I've cleansed my heart and washed my hands. Well, you know, then I made a mistake becoming a Christian because, look, I became a Christian and, and, you know, all these bad things are going on. And look at these other people. They're not Christian and everything they're doing is prospering and it's wonderful. For all day long have I been smitten and plagued and chastened every morning. See, that, that's kind of a normal reaction, but it's not wise, as you will see. But he says... In verse 15, he finally starts to get to wisdom, the psalmist does, and says, Well, had I spoken thus and given expression to my feelings, I would have been untrue, and I would not only have, would I not have had the truth, but I would, that would have been a bad thing, a bad influence on my children and on those around me. That's not, a good, that's not a good attitude to carry around. That's, well, I shouldn't ever become a Christian. No, it's like, that's, that's, that's not good. But... Nonetheless, when I considered how to understand this, it was too great an effort for me and too painful until I went into the sanctuary of God. See, that's back to that Romans 12 thing. It's like, well, until you, you lay your life before God and say, okay, God, here I am, warts and all, take me. And then he will begin to reveal stuff to you that you weren't seeing before. And that happens to the psalmist right here. He said, Until I went into the sanctuary of God, and then I understood therein. After all, you do set the wicked in slippery places. You cast them down to ruin and destruction. 
Not that we want that, but it's like all the things that the devil's telling us that isn't happening. Well, it is happening. Verse 22. So foolish and stupid and brutal, brutish was I and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. See, the psalmist finally got some wisdom there and thought, hey, you know, the way I was looking at that, that was just natural. That was just flesh. That was not wisdom at all. Nevertheless, verse 23, I'm continually with you. You do hold my right hand and you will, gu you will guide me with your counsel and afterwards receive me to glory. So these are counterfeits that I've been talking about to wisdom and hopefully we've seen by way of contrast how to recognize when any of those characteristics are manifesting that that's not God and we should reject it. Okay, but let's go back to 2 Peter. I want to close with a couple of things here. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 16. When God reveals wisdom through His Word, we, we do have to apply ourselves to understand that Word. Now, applying it can take a lot of forms. I don't have a magic formula to tell you how you know, if you will study the Bible this way, and hey, you know, there are plenty of, you know, study Bibles that will tell you, you know, go through the Bible in this way and, you know, look up these words and, and look up these themes and so forth. Okay, there's countless of those. And, and I'm not saying that you should, that any one of those is necessarily how God is going to do it with you. And for that matter, you know, there's, there's listening to it. I, I, there was years and years that I listened to, to uh, 33 and a third LP vinyl records of Alexander Scorby reading the Bible. And I just let that go constantly in my background. I let it go while I was sleeping. And um, it gets in there because God's Word has sticking power. And so... It's like the guy, the, TV, the car commercial. I don't care how you get here, folks. Just get here. All right. But, but that said, we should not presume that because we are a Romans 8 or because we're a Baptist or because we're a, a Pentecostal or we're this or that, that we, you know, that our doctrine is right and we've got it all in a box right here, that that's, that's too elementary that is too simplistic it's like that's a mistake is what he's saying here speaking of these things as he does in his letters there are some things in the epistles of Paul that are difficult to understand now there's some places where Paul says well I, I want to you know when I was with the the when I first came to you I just you know, I just spoke to, to those who were babes in Christ. I fed you with milk. Okay, well, there's that. But, you know, there's also some things that are rather complicated. There, there's the whole, you know, it's like, like creation. There's some things that are rather plain, and there's some things that are awfully complicated. And God's, God is the author of creation, so His Word is like that, too. Don't assume that everything in the Bible, you're just going to take it at face value based upon what your understanding of those words are. That's why I use Strong's Concordance so much. Because uh, I think I know English pretty well, but it may not mean what it says in English might not be what God said to Paul or to, you know, whoever the wrote that. And there are some things that are difficult to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist and misconstrue and right there describes all of the false doctrines that exist in any version of Christianity today. They're, they're, they're twisting and misconstructions of what 
God actually said. And it's to their own utter destruction, and just as they do the rest of the scriptures. So let me warn you, therefore, beloved, that knowing these things beforehand, you should be on your guard lest you be carried away by the error of lawless and wicked persons and fall from your own firm condition, your own steadfastness. Now, it's like Owen Cain said to me that time, whatever you know about God, there's more. I think having a, having a, a, a desire to always be going deeper and to, to have more revelation is necessary. I think once we decide, hey, I, you know, I'm satisfied with what I've got already. I, you know, I've got enough to chew on now. Don't give me anything else. Don't bother me with end time prophecy or don't bother me with demonology or don't bother me with this or that. You know, I just want simple salvation. It's like, no, you need, you need to keep moving on. There's, there's so much there. You're never going to come to the end of it. Don't stop somewhere. My dad who was, of course, he was a college math teacher. But he had a favorite saying. He used to quote this. It's actually from Alexander Pope. But a lot of things Alexander Pope said were kind of, they line up with the Bible a lot. He said, a little learning is a dangerous thing. Drink deep or don't taste from the Pyrian spring. Now, the Pyrian spring was a, a reference to something in Greek mythology where they believed that all wisdom came forth. It was like a spring that came forth out of the ground and the, the wise ones, the poets and the, the philosophers and what, and they would go drink from that spring and that's where they would get their, it was, you know, it's a, just a fairy tale. That wasn't the truth at all. But that's what they called the Pyrian spring. So the Pyrian spring is a metaphor for the source of wisdom. Well, for us, the Pyrean spring is the Word of God. So what my father was saying, if we apply that to us, it's like, like a little knowledge of the Word is a dangerous thing. You know, it's like you better go deep or, or else, you know, you better keep your mouth shut. Right? But, verse 18, but grow in grace and spiritual strength and recognition and knowledge and understanding of our Lord and Savior. Grow in that, you see, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And to Him be glory, honor, and majesty, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. I want to give you, I want to give you one more scripture. Ephesians chapter 3. You know, there are these references that we come across about future things. You know, the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ, the, the new Jerusalem, uh, eternity, the eternity of eternities, um, things that are so far beyond what we can wrap our minds around that I understand why some people might say, well, that's some golden daybreak. I, you know, I need something that, that's meaningful to me now. Well, we should understand that what God has for us covers both, both time frames. It covers now, and, 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 and if, it, if it's the truth, it's going to work now, and it's going to work forever. It's going to work here in this earth when Jesus comes back to rule and reign and then whatever happens after that when there's a new, a new heaven and a new earth it's going to work there because God doesn't change. And these things are eternal. They are magnificent. Well let me, let, let's, let's let the scripture say it. Go to Ephesians 3 verse 16. May God grant you out of the rich treasury of His glory to be strengthened and reinforced with mighty power in the inner man by the Holy Spirit Himself indwelling your innermost being and personality. May Christ through your faith actually dwell and settle down and make His permanent home in your hearts. 
May you be rooted deep in love and founded securely on love that you may have the power and be strong to apprehend and grasp along with all the saints, God's devoted people, the experience of that love, what is the breadth and length and height and depth of it, that you may really come to know practically through experience for yourselves the love of Christ, which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience. See, it's one thing if you're a baby Christian and you don't know anything and you lean upon more mature Christians and they pray with you and they tell you, well, the Word says this and look, God's going to do this and trust Him and, and okay, but you know, sooner or later you're going to have to walk it out and you're going to have to find out in your life okay, God is going to get me through whatever this thing is. And, and if you start thinking, well, hey, it happened this way for this person, it's supposed to happen that way for me. Well, maybe not. That's their experience. You have your experience. They have their experience. And this is why he said, for you to know for experience for yourselves the love of Christ which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience, that you may be filled, and this is going off into eternity, that you may be filled through all your being unto the fullness of God, that you may have the richest measure of the divine presence. So that that we were talking about in Second Peter 1, and we, we're not just going to get a little taste of that, but he wants us to be filled with it, and become a body wholly filled and flooded with God Himself. And now to Him who by consequence of the power that's at work in us is able to carry out His purpose and do super abundantly above all that we ask or dare think, infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, hopes, and dreams, to Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.